Welcome to AI to Z, your gateway to the world of STEM and the career shaping its future. Hosted by AirSwift's Chief Revenue Officer, Anna Frazetto, we delve into artificial intelligence, health tech, and more. With insights from industry leaders, Anna not only demystifies STEM, but also highlights the exciting career paths within. Whether you're an enthusiast, a professional, or considering a STEM career, tune in and journey with us into the future. Hi, Ken. It's so terrific to have you here. Uh, just let me explain a little bit to the audience uh, who you are, right? Chief Information Officer, Chief Technology Officer. You've been involved with Fortune 500 organizations for uh, a couple of decades. You enjoy creating strategies that help drive business growth in, in startups and, and rapidly expanding into mid-market companies. So you really have kind of covered a full gamut. The one area that I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about is you've had a tremendous career in media and advertising for years. You probably have seen more transformations. You were talking about digital transformation before digital transformation was something that organizations were actually talking about. Maybe a good place for us to start is for you to kind of share a little bit some memorable high highlights, either good or bad. Yeah, thank you. Um... So the one, you know, it's interesting. I was going through my head as you're saying that and just thinking about what I've done in the past and all the projects and initiatives. And, you know, my early part of the career was very much focused on technology operations, right? You know, how are we connecting everybody together? Um, you know, what is just the, you know, dial tone of um, compute for everybody in the office? Uh, and then I would say probably in the, uh, around 2012, 2014, it really started to shift. Uh, and my career started to really focus on those transformation technologies that really made a difference in an organization from how people worked, where it wasn't just how they did their, um, they connected, but how they were working within the, the company. And so, you know, as you're just saying that, one of the areas that um, flashed in my head is I, um, I like to think of myself as sort of a, a cutting edge person when I leverage technology in the organization. Some people would have said that I was bleeding edge, but I would have said that I was cutting edge. Um, and I really saw what was happening in the collaboration space. Uh, early on, this is like maybe 2008, 2010, and what did what did collaboration mean to companies and businesses? And so back then, one of the uh, exciting moments is when we were bringing together um, various technologies because it wasn't as cohesive as what we have today with Microsoft Teams or with Zoom or or um, with Google with uh, with um, workspaces. So, you know, back then it was like, okay, we had uh, a Jabber for a voice, we had WebEx for video, we had something else for instant messaging, um, we had Skype, right? And you're trying to piece all these pieces together. You had a really arcane version of, uh, of SharePoint um, that you were using as sort of this intranet um, back then. So, you know, one of the moments is when I, I got all of these different components to talk together. And we presented to the organization as this is a way forward on how to collaborate and saying that we're going to start shifting out of email and into this concept of instant messaging. And people are like, well, what's this instant messaging thing? Um, and so back then to really show that and we had, you know, very little stats of people using IM. And to when you fast forward and you start to see where the technology has more seamlessly integrated these different components to make it much more collaborative for individuals as teams, to, as individuals communicate with clients, uh, as individuals to collaborate around platforms and, and ideas and solutions, you know, really that, that beginning point of seeing where things were going to where um, our instant messaging platform, like, you know, hundredfold dwarfed what we saw uh, happening in, in um, emails, which was, you know, quite a success uh, that, that I would say. Um, and it was a lot of fun uh, at, at that time. One of the other areas, I'll, I'll jump to, a, you know, converse of that, and it still goes back to the early days, and I, and I have some more recent stories, but some of the early days, I remember, you know, where we were, you know, things weren't in the cloud. They were all on-prem, and, uh, you know, we had this sand that we were running in the environment, and it crashed. And, you know, I mean, we were talking back, you know, back in the day, it was, you know, terabytes of on-site storage, 
And how do you recover for that? And it was, you know, a weekend of, you know, 72 hours just up and, and doing the resource, re- reconnecting all of the access rights and, you know, bringing things back online so that the business didn't have a disruption by the time we got back on Monday, which we were successful. Um, but it was, uh, you know, quite a stressful weekend working with our partners to try to solve and, and rebuild and, and um, you know, get things running again. So it's kind of like, you know, it's sort of two extremes now on that's that side. fascinating, Ken. I'll, I'll tell you, I think we could probably write a book and watching how technology has impacted our lives, you know, in every phase, like you think you're so advanced and then you get to a point of saying, oh my goodness, take a look at what we're doing today versus what we were doing, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Oh, right. Yes. Even five years ago, Anna, when you think back five years, so much has changed just in the last five years. And, you know, maybe even we'll say it next year when you look back over this past year, over 2023, and we think about, you know, with the introduction, uh, I think it was November 11th, 2022, Chat GPT, you know, became released. Um, and just January, everybody was touching it, um, talking about it. December, people were talking about it, but really January. Um, it became a, like this, you know, crazy person on the street and everybody was having conversations. Everybody was touching it, trying to figure that out. So when you look back, I think when we look back on this year, um, it's just the beginning of such a renaissance oh, in technology. It's, it's, I agree a hundred percent. So actually that kind of steers the conversation to let's talk a little bit about what's going on today. Social media has taken over. And I think that's the reason why ChatGBT became so popular so quick, thanks to social media. Let's not forget about RPA or AI as we're talking about. What exciting trends are you seeing? What should we look out for? The biggest piece that I am having conversations with people today is how do we use it um, cautiously. Um, so we need to experiment. We need to be applying it into our businesses. Um, at the same time, we want to make sure that we're double checking the data that we're getting out. We're confirming that the messaging is coming uh, out properly um, because we got to remember these platforms want to provide an answer. Um, and so they're going to give us some sort of answer. We have to just weigh that answer and then drill down and ask for the questions. So I think that's one part, um, and that's going to lay into you know the ethics around what this means, um, you know as society, what's going to you know change, and you know how do we adapt for that? I think that many of the jobs that people have today are are going to disappear, uh, but many new jobs are going to get created as as a result of this. It's not just going to be oh my god, all these people lost these jobs, which that will happen. But I think at the same time, we got to look at the optimistic side of things and say all these new positions and roles and capabilities are going to evolve from it. Um, and then people will stop doing, especially the office workers, will um, not be involved in such mundane tasks as moving data around or starting with a blank sheet of paper anymore. You know, you'll be able to ideate faster and, and come up with uh, a framework that you can now catapult on. Um, I always find when I'm working on presentations with my team, you know, they work on the first draft and then it's great. I can help edit it and we go back and forth and, and you know, we build up the presentation. But oftentimes we're at the spot of not a, uh, that we're not starting from a blank piece of paper. We'll pull from different things. And I think that's what we're going to start seeing more with um, these LLMs and AI capabilities on one hand. I think when you're combining AI and RPA, um, that business transformation is, is you know, going to be um, exponential. Um, and that's probably going to be in the next two to three years, we're going to really start to see businesses transform when you're combining both of those capabilities. Right. You know, Ken, you, you really hit on a key point as far as, you know, these tools can kind of help you get started so that you're not starting with a blank slate. And then, but then it's a matter for you to validate, you know, is this data accurate? You know, how do we fine tune it? Um, let's talk a little bit about the challenge we often get asked about the availability of resources to be able to do the cool new things in the world of STEM. How do you approach talent acquisition 
and most importantly, retention. This has been a growing challenge and a moving target. I mean, for years, we've known each other for more years than we care to, uh, to, to admit. But it's always been a challenge as far as getting people that are, are properly skilled in the latest and greatest technology and that they want to stay in it. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to take it from the how do you retain your talent? And I think that is such a key element when you're looking at, you know, how businesses are successful. Um, it's we're in this time period right now where there's a um, a number of organizations that are letting good talent go. Um, and so that is, um, you know, shaking up the marketplace a bit. But when you look at how that knowledge of the organization is going out the door, how do you keep the right talent um, and understanding the impact to the organization, right? Um, I think it's become, we've shifted a bit uh, to more recently where you're really communicating with the team members you're understanding what their path where they want to go and how you can help them as a leader my role is to help them become successful and you know most of the time i really want to make sure that they're successful within our organization but if i'm true to making sure they're successful then we'll benefit at the end as an organization so, you know, part of it is going to be understanding their path, you know, giving them the proper um, training program, but really it comes down to communicating and creating that relationship. I think that also is a bit difficult today when you think about the level of um, people that are um, remote, right? So how does that play into this whole uh, office atmosphere, you know, in, in um, you know, the days before the pandemic and everybody was in the office or the majority of the people were in the office, um, you could have that camaraderie. You were building those, those relationships. And, and I said during, um, during the pandemic, right, you know, you were depositing money in the ATM back then. When you're in, uh, in, interacting with people, you're creating that goodwill, you were creating that connection point. And then with the pandemic, you were you were pulling on those connection points to help drive something forward, or relying on those um, those relationships that you establish in order to help things succeed in the in in the business. And so, you know, when you when we're now that we're coming out of it, we need to reestablish those things. Now, does that mean we need to be in the office every day? I think that for certain workers, absolutely. I think for other workers, you need to be there certain time periods in order to rebuild some of those credits and to establish yourself um, again together and collectively. So, you know, I see talent as something that requires more nurturing today than it has um, in, you know, in the past. And I think the type of workers that are coming in, um, the Gen Zs that are coming into the workplace now, you know, that has shifted really that perception of um, the business is not just, I'm not there just for the business. I'm also there for me. And I think in, in, at a point in time, the business was like, oh, you're lucky to be here. Um, and so we've seen that shift. And I, and I think the Gen Z group um, are not afraid to walk away if they're not happy with an aspect of an organization, whether it's a, a social aspect of the organization or, you know, the, the strain um, or the stress that they're perceiving. So... As executives, we need to be thinking about how to manage and how to work um, with uh, the employees today in a variety, as I said, in a variety of different ways, you know, from being remote to also the younger generation. Um, and a lot of that centers around their, um, you know, with their path and how we as leaders can help them on their path. Right. The other Go side. Ahead. Sorry, Ken. You know, I was, I was just going to add, you know, when I look at the other side and how do you find the talent that, you know, that is still such an elusive, uh, elusive component, um, you know, because I think when you look at all the um, automation that is happening and all of the tools that recruiters have now that filter just through resumes and then people are optimizing their resumes just to get through these filters you know it, you, it's harder to find that the true talent that is out there in order to really see how they're going to match because i think we're missing a lot of talent 
because of these um, tools that are now filtering out good talent and not getting it to um, the recruiters to, to interview or to have the conversation with. Right. So you hit on so many uh, golden nuggets here as far as the conversation. I want to kind of go back to, to the retention point. Uh, I think what's really changed, you mentioned Gen Z uh, individuals entering the, entering the workforce. They view their career, it almost has, it's, it's like three, three different um, silos of prongs as to how they approach it. One has got to be like the cultural atmosphere of the yeah. organization, right? The other is what is the organization doing to give back to society? So uh, the challenge of, of looking at um, ESG programs within companies. Yeah. And then the last, you know, silo or prong is, you know, what career enhancements, what will I get out? What will I learn? Which is so different from, I think, you know, what, when I approach the workforce or you approach the workforce, we truly looked at the skills and the job at hand and what we, we would get out of it and how it would enhance our career. So maybe not three prong, maybe two prong mm -hmm. uh, approach. But that makes it harder for employees to retain talent. I agree. But I also think it's a little bit of a good thing that's going on because it does challenge organizations to really think about, you know, this is a 360 solution that yeah. we have to come up with. It's not just 180 or anything like that. Uh, the, the other aspect is attracting talent early, you know, making STEM fun and cool and exciting yeah. within schools so that we don't have single digit students graduating in the STEM field in this country, as opposed to when you compare it to other countries like in Asia, where they're, you know, 85% plus yeah. graduating in STEM. So we need to, we need to kind of shift paradigm shift as far as how we can attract talent early on, uh, quite frankly, because yeah. Now we're dependent on, you know, can we bring talent from other parts of the world to be able to do some of these, you know, technology driven uh, aspects of, of, of a job? Yeah. And I'm starting to see more um, colleges and universities really um, amp up their their programs in, in this category. Um, I was working with my uh, alma mater, Assumption University, and they, uh, I helped them develop a cybersecurity program. So they started this maybe about three or four years ago, because when you're looking at that talent that is out there, a lot of today, the talent in cybersecurity has come from experience, right? You know, it's been sort of on the job. You didn't have a lot of these programs. There's not a technical institute. Um, there is a lot of online training, which I think that's the other element, Anna, that is shifting is there's much more online content for training um, and education than there has been in the past. But, you know, I think there's a level that the universities uh, and the colleges, you know, are starting to recognize this and build up more programs um, that are focused not just on general computers, right? But really, how do they look at it across all aspects of, of technology today? And, you know, when, when you look around, many companies still don't think that they're a technology company. And I would argue that almost every company today is a technology company, maybe not farming, but the amount of technology used in farming is really a fascinating um, and how they're optimizing, you know, the crop and the placement, you know, for example. Um, but, you know, advertising was about creative, uh, you know, back in the day, 20 years ago. And then today, you know, it's about data. Um, so it's really interesting to see that transformation of an industry that, you know, is all about ideas and then now it's all about data. Now you're combining the two, right? So you're evolving um, the industries, uh, but it does go back to, you know, where is that, where is that talent that's coming out with that um, perspective? And I think, you know, again, we talk about, um, you know, this generative AI world that is now launched. What does that mean for talent? How are colleges going to adapt to that so that, um, students are coming out with that as a knowledge base and a skill set that all businesses are going to be looking for in three plus years, right? 
Um, I think there's going to, we'll see a surge in, um, you know, English uh, classes and courses, right? Because a lot of it is how you're talking or communicating with the LLMs and how you're, you know, refining what you're asking to then optimize what, where you're going. So that may be a stronger um, uh, requisite you know, for, for students coming out, not just the maths anymore. I think that'll add a, a little twist to it. Right. You know what, Ken, you, you, I'm glad you shared as far as, you know, what colleges are doing. I think that's the other area that the gap needs to close. Because if you think about it, you're mentioning about your alma mater, you know, introducing a cybersecurity class, which is, you know, course, uh, which is fantastic. But if you think about it, you know, colleges should have been introducing that type of course yeah. material, you know, five years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and so like that, that the students were getting prepared to enter into the workforce and be prepared and having a foundation in that subject matter. So when we, we talk about the future of AI and LLM, um, how do we prepare how do we prepare for, for that? What else do we need to do? I think you hit on it when you talked about STEM, you know, but we need to bring it earlier. We're starting to see high schools that are now, you know, stronger in STEM. Um, you know, so those programs are starting to develop earlier on. Um, I think it's also difficult because when you look around and you see how rapidly things are changing, universities, um, you know, looking at, you don't want to just jump on the latest trend. Um, I'll make fun of blockchain for a second, right? That was going to solve the world's problems, um, you know, whatever, eight plus years ago when it was introduced and it kind of fizzled a little bit, right? Now, it's still an important aspect and it's still an important element, uh, but knowing where we're using it um, in business and how we're, you know, clearing out the supply chain and, and making that relationship between, you know, the product uh, or even the natural resources and following it is, is great. But, um, you know, I give that as an example because I think colleges, uh, some of them were starting to see that and they built courses, which I think that's probably the right thing to do is to build a course that is part of a larger uh, program and not just part, not just a certain discipline that they're they're bringing to the table. Um, so I think it's going to be it's going to be difficult to for the journey. But when we look at generative AI, it's not one of those things that's going away. I think it's a matter of um, picking the right part of that discipline to build it up because we're going to be looking for that talent of how you're working with and interacting with um, with generative AI technologies and how does that transform you know organizations and what do they need to be thinking of and how are they they're going to approach it so it's going to be much more of a skill set like we're speaking english here today um, it's going to be much more of a skill set that people are going to have to know in every aspect of what they're doing it's not just going to be oh it's this generative ai program over here it's going to be how we do everything, you know, how we're doing econom uh, uh, econometrics, how we're doing, you know, English, how we're doing marketing, how we're doing, um, you know, campaign creation, things like that. It's going to be really um, a core skill set that everybody's going to need, not just a, a separation. So universities, colleges, high schools, you know, they're all going to have to incorporate that type of learning into um, everyday education and not just as a separate program. So that's what I see a little bit different here um, than than like cybersecurity, where that's like a, an entity that you can put your, I don't want to say put your arms around, but you can say, okay, these are the skill sets you need. Whereas generative AI, it's so broad in what we're we're, we're going to need in the business. So now let, let's take the conversation and talk a little bit about is the world of tech getting too detached from the human element? You know, how do we embrace both or how do we create the right balance? Are you concerned at all about the future? Yes, on one side and no on the other side. I mean, you know, I have two boys that are, you know, in high school and you looking at where, what does that mean for their future? How is this going to change for them? I think about their interactions, you know, oftentimes a bunch of people get together, a bunch of their friends and, you know, they're maybe downstairs on, I don't hear a word, right? There's 12 kids down there and I go down there, they're all on their devices, but they're communicating together. They're interacting together. Um, so I, I think when we... Uh, look at the human element to where the future is going to be. 
Um, that's going to be a critical aspect of how we weave that in and how we think about it as, as part of, um, uh, uh, you know, as part of society that we have to be conscious of. I think when we, we have some experiences, coincidentally enough, to learn from with the pandemic and the lockdown, right? You know, what happened to people? What was that isolation? Um, you know, you know, as we came out of that, you know, some people, you know, won't leave their home now, right? They got so used to that, that space. Um, and it takes a little bit of time to, to, you know, socialize again. So I think that's going to be an important element as we look at, you know, the generative AI technologies and remembering that we are all humans, that this is, you know, for humankind and trying to, you know, make improvements, you know, along the journey um, and, you know, make sure that we're, you know, being conscious of these steps that we're taking today, um, you know, to move that forward. I know, I know the CIO over at the uh, United Nations, and that is absolutely something as a group of countries that they're talking about, what is this going to be? What is the impact of this uh, AI to, you know, the world's population? Um, and what does that mean for world employment and, and that sort of stuff? So there are a lot bigger minds than myself thinking about this, um, but I am, I'm glad and I think that everybody needs to keep that element in balance, you know, business success with, you know, humans because if we if we're not around and we're not consuming and we're not getting paid then we're sorry if we're not getting paid then we're not able to consume and then their products are not going to get sold right so it becomes this this circle um, that we need to balance as a society well Ken, sadly this kind of brings us to the end of our podcast one closing thought that you'd like to leave uh, the audience with maybe a focus word or power word uh, that we can leave the audience with yeah. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, don't be afraid to try things out. Um, you know, figure out how you can get that sandbox going, figure out, you know, what this could mean to you personally, as well as to what it means to your company or where you want to go on a path. But take that journey now um, and try it out because I think it's fascinating. It's exciting. Um, and it's something that's going to be here for a long time to come. Well, thank you so much, Ken. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for joining us on the AI to Z podcast with Anna Frazetto. If you found value in today's episode, consider following for more insightful STEM discussions. We'll be back with another deep dive. Until then. <laughs>